questions. Uh, good evening, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Meredith Malone, and I'm the curator at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum. Before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that we are meeting on the ancestral lands of the Osage Nation, Musaria Ilini Confederacy, and many of the other tribes who were unjustly removed. We recognize these communities as we live, work, study, and benefit from this occupied land. Uh, just last week on January 19th, uh, Unmasking Health Counter Perspectives opened in the museum's teaching gallery. Uh, the teaching gallery is a space within the museum dedicated to displaying works from the museum's collection with direct connections to Washington University courses. This installation is curated by Yvonne Bouyan, postdoctoral fellow in women, gender, and sexuality studies in conjunction with his seminar titled Queering the History of Health. If you haven't had a chance to see the installation in person yet, it will be on view in the teaching gallery through May 2nd. And tonight, I'm very happy to be joined by Dr. Bouyan, who will discuss his show, which thoughtfully engages the subject of health as a contested arena embedded in exclusionary ideologies of race, gender, sexuality, and class. The installation includes a range of artworks uh, from the 1960s to today in the collection of the Kemper Art Museum, placed in dialogue with archival ephemera from Washington University Library's special collections. So in addition to scrutinizing notions of what a healthy body is, um, Unmasking Health also invites viewers to reconsider the role that historical and contemporary grassroots movements, including the ongoing AIDS movement and the movement for black lives have had in connecting issues of health and social justice. And now I would like to formally introduce our speaker. Ivan Bouyan received a PhD in performance studies from Northwestern University and holds two master's degrees, one in performance studies from New York University and the other in gender studies from Central European University. Bouyan works at the intersections of critical race, or critical gender, race, and sexuality studies in contemporary visual cultures and performance. And he's deeply invested in creating publicly engaged scholarship on social justice and disparities in health. His in progress book manuscript highlights strategies queer of color artists have utilized to circumvent white supremacy, cis masculinity, ableism and systemic racism in the cultural history of the ongoing HIV AIDS crisis. This project centers on a seldom studied domain of work related to AIDS, the visual motif of anti HIV drug regime, regimes within art and visual cultures that respond to the contested pharmaceutical and sexual politics of the late 1980s onward. Bouyan's research appears in edited volumes of Viral Dramaturgies, HIV and AIDS in Performance in the 21st Century from 2018, and Undesiring Whiteness, Undoing Sexual Racism, which is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. He's also published in Masculinities, a Journal of Identity and Culture and Theater Journal. I have one last technical note this evening's program will run for about one hour and we are recording this event. We encourage you to participate by asking questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Dr. Bouyan will answer as many questions as he can in the latter half of this program. And now I'd like to turn things over to you, Yvonne, and congratulate you on a really terrific uh, installation. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you and to work with you um, these past couple of months. Uh, thank you very much, Meredith, for this lovely introduction. Uh, before I start, uh, I would like to send some shouts out to the world. Uh, thank you, Meredith, uh, and thanks everybody at Kemper, uh, Kim Broker, Jose Garza, Meredith Liman, Janet Nidhart. Uh, this is a truly enriching experience. Uh, I would also like to thank Miranda Rechtenwald, uh, curator of local history in the special collections at Olin Library at Washington University. Uh, also, thanks to my uh, home department, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, and especially professors Rebecca Lanzo and Trevor Sangre for their support and encouragement, uh, and also Professor Jeff Ward uh, in African American Studies for inspiring conversation uh, and some suggestions uh, regarding the installation. Uh, many thanks to artists, community organizers, and artists who lent their work. Uh, and of course, thanks uh, everybody. I can see you in this webinar mode uh, for joining us after dark here in St. Louis. Uh, as uh, Meredith said, I'm going to be talking about my installation at the teaching gallery. I'm also going to be talking a little bit about uh, my spring course and how the two relate. Uh, 
because they exist in conjunction to one another. Uh, and in a nutshell, uh, the show uh, has been inspired uh, by at least three pandemics we are currently experiencing, some more, some less. Uh, this, uh, these pandemics are uh, triggered by COVID-19, uh, HIV AIDS, and uh, the pandemic of anti-Black racism. Uh, the title, Unmasking or Masking Health, uh, it's a play of words, right? We live under masks at the moment as a public health mandate, uh, at least most of us. Uh, while the show unmasks what the notions of health actually entails, right? In its political, historical, and cultural dimension, once uh, we take it apart, right? So that's what kind of the show is about, taking apart notion of health, right? Uh, to deconstruct that notion. Uh, as I said, uh, the show has been organized in a conjunction with my seminar, Queering the History of Health, uh, which takes into consideration historical, so, uh, social, political, and cultural aspects of health through a queer, feminist, and intersectional lens. Uh, with my students, a very amazing group of students, we trace various contingencies that produce a set of false binaries, right? And uh, some of those binaries uh, include uh, a healthy, slender, responsible self versus disabled, fat, and irresponsible other. Uh, and uh, the, the course kind of uh, points how those binaries have been used as a powerful ideological weapon against uh, everybody who's not considered normal, right? Uh, including queer and trans people of color, people with disabilities, people living with HIV AIDS, fat people, uh, and other who cannot or do not want to uh, embody normative phrase, gender and sexuality and ability demands. Uh, so on the one hand, the class kind of, you know, exposes those systems of power, but at the same time, uh, it's also kind of optimistic. So it shows how somehow counterintuitively uh, those power dynamics enable a predisposition for resistance, world making, and political agency. Uh, the course is interdisciplinary. It engages art, social sciences, and critical theory. Uh, and uh, the teaching gallery has been an amazing opportunity to take the learning process beyond the classroom. I'm always very excited to. Uh, it's always nice to go outside into the world, you know. Um, yeah. So, uh, and next week, right, for example, students are students and I are going to meet at the gallery uh, and each student is going to choose a piece of art or archival ephemera that speaks to them. And they're going to uh, include that in their midterms uh, and uh, they're going to uh, kind of use ephemera and artwork to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to kind of uh, see how art and uh, activism sp uh, speaks to the readings and discussions it's been having in class, right? Uh, so for the remainder of my talk today, uh, I'm going to frame my show. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about organization and the three sections. I'm going to go into uh, analysis of some of the works in each section, and then we're going to have hopefully a productive and nice um, a discussion. Um, so uh, if uh, we could uh, share my presentation on Meredith. And if we could go to the first line. Thank you. So uh, as I said, my point of departure was to unpack, unpack what uh, is actually health, right? Uh, uh, to understand the complexities of the health crisis caused by HIV, AIDS, COVID, and anti-Black racism. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, I looked into WHO's definition of health, right? Um, next slide. Uh, health uh, is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease uh, or infirmity. The enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fun uh, fundamental rights of every human being without this, uh, this uh, distinction of race, religion political belief, economic or social conditions. So this is basically a very neoliberal kind of uh, uh, definition, right? That needs to be unpacked because it's problematic uh, on multiple levels, right? So for example, this definition was formulated in 1948 and a lot have happened since then. So for example, there's a logical fallacy, right? The requirement for complete health, right? Would leave most of us unhealthy most of the time, right? So uh, that also kind of, uh, uh, goes into you know uh, health uh, goes into overt medicalization of society right uh, that is in support of drug industry right it kind of uh, invents conditions uh, and you know to sell drugs 
the definition does not include scientific and technological advances. Uh, for example, it excludes a chronic condition, right? It treats disability as, uh, as illness too, right? Uh, uh, in a nutshell, it's exclusionary bias and coercive and show kind of, you know, uh, digs deeper into that uh, to show why and how, right? So I was curious how practice this definition by public health, health promotional discourses and other authorities in the West European and North American territories affect people's behaviors, impact their subjective experiences and shape their identities. Uh, right, so uh, these authorities uh, reproduce division between uh, what is healthy and what is unhealthy. And then based on that division, pathologists people or stigmatized people who do not embody uh, health based on this definition, right? So as I said, for example, uh, according to WHO's definition, people with disabilities are not healthy, even though you know they may require very little medical care uh, or uh, ongoing treatment um, in their lives, right? Uh, in addition, by promoting certain type of health, medical knowledge and health promotional discourses reproduce and support gender, class and racial uh, inequality, right? Uh, and this is kind of what the idea of section uh, one is for section. Uh, next slide, please which is uh, on uh, beauty, health, uh, and the body. Uh, so the section seeks to understand the ways in which the bodies of individuals have been constructed through multiple regulations of public health and other establishments that follow that regulations, right? And by that, I mean uh, schools, uh, the law, uh, just, you know, any type of uh, institution that is, you know, based on uh, state, nation states run uh, uh, regulations, right? Or follows those closely. So once these uh, establishments uh, decide upon what counts as healthy in the process, they simultaneously produce ideologies of desirable body image uh, that as accurate gesturing is predicated on the aesthetic uh, of normatively gendered, many times heterosexual, uh, but almost uh, always slender white body. So, and the section puts on display everything that a healthy body is not, right? So it kind of puts on display uh, anomalies produced by uh, a health definition and um, uh, expectation of what a desirable health should be, right? So, uh, so uh, the section fo focuses on those anomalies, right? Uh, anomalies, uh, but it also kind of, you know, shows that what is uh, considered healthy is not immune to race and sex stereotypes, right? Uh, next slide, please. So in this regard, uh, we have uh, Jean Dunnings and Saul Mednick's uh, photographs that tackle a bodily object, right? Uh, so on the left, there is unidentifiable wound-like orifice. And then on the right, we have belly fat, right? And both of those uh, entities solicit a visceral reaction, right? Uh, especially from a viewer uh, who may be indoctrinated into what traditional narratives about how beauty body image uh, should be, right? Uh, next slide. So uh, for example, Dunning, uh, whose work explores relationship to our own physicality, uh, looks at the strange and unfamiliar in the body. Uh, so, uh, this is supposed to kind of be whimsical, right? It creates the appearance of anatomic aberrations to play with people's preconceptions and provoke uh, misconception, association, and un uncontrolled interpretation of what we see, right? In this photograph here, uh, the viewer is confronted with this uh, uncomfortably close view of a fleshy texture, right? F a fleshy texture surface with a red uh, chasm excuse me, that's kind of suggestive of anatomical orifice, but it's basically an actor with a slice removed, right? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, Saul Mednick's uh, photographer uh, appeared in the 1968 subscription-based art journal SMS that's short for Shit Must Stop. Uh, so, and what's interesting about this uh, work, and we can uh, have a discussion about it later, hopefully, uh, is its title, right? It's titled Hoten dot Apron. And that is uh, that was a medical uh, slang for a fat stomach, right? And uh, as some of us know, the word Hoten tot was historically used to refer to the Khoi Khoi people of Southern Africa, and then a Hoten tot Apron uh, to an elongated labium, right? Uh, a physical feature associated with, associated with uh, Khoi Khoi women uh, by Western European scientists in the 18th and 19th century, right? So, um, the reason why this is interesting is because it shows us that uh, fat as a physical anomaly is a racialized and racist notion, right? Uh, so basically we can think about how uh, pathologizing everything that is not 
whiteness and slender whiteness uh, operates, right? Uh, and then at the same time, using race and difference, right? Uh, to define what is healthy and what is normal. Uh, next slide. So as I said, uh, although this section focuses on anomalies, uh, it also shows that, uh, uh, you know, what a viewer may recognize as healthy is a source of desire and fantasy, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's not immune to sexist and misogynist stereotypes. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, Mel Ramos's work, uh, uh, so-called uh, three-dimensional pop art sculpture candy also appeared uh, in the subscription-based art journal SMS, which is basically a cutout doll equating white femininity through the consumption of candy, right? So on the, on the uh, right side, we can see how, how, how it works, right? Once it's cut out. Uh, next slide. And then we have uh, Mark Bennett, who uses imagery from the 60s and uh, 70s, right? And in a collage effect of Ford's on Barbara, uh, it's this imagery, it's a, it's a series of, uh, you know, Barbara and her worldlings. Uh, so it includes imaginary character Barbara uh, and a friend, uh, and they admire a half uh, naked black man who's posing on the hood of a Ford automobile. Uh, I assume that in 2010s, uh, Barbara's friends would probably be called Karen. Uh, so, and this is from a catalog. Uh, I find it interesting for my context. Of, it says Ford is, and this is a quote, a common, a common symbol of American family values and consumer culture as the object of Barbara's transgressive desires and an escape vehicle from suburban life. Bennett uh, conflates racial stereotyping and material commodification, both uh, lament pervasive in mainstream American culture and subverts nostalgic notions of the 1960s as a time of promise and prosperity." End of quote. So, I mean, clearly this is a very complicated collage, right? Uh, and it raises questions I was thinking about, right? Uh, it equates a car that's a commodity with a black male body, right? That was also historically commodified, right? Uh, you know, then the question is, is the black man an allegory of Barbara's transgressive desire, right? Uh, and then 1960s were time of promise and prosperity for whom, right? Uh, and those questions kind of bring us to the second section uh, that is about the 60s uh, and uh, uh, about the civil rights movement. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this section considers historical and political aspects of health, thinking about it in relation to equality and equity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this section considers the role of systemic racism. Uh, I uh, prepare a definition uh, of structural racism uh, here for you tonight and uh, how uh, systemic or structural racism plays into the narrative of health disparities in the history of the USA, right? I mean, health disparities is a newer term, uh, but uh, the fact is, uh, as we know, discrepancy in health between uh, Black people, people of color, Indigenous people, and white people has been around for around 400 years. And some hysterical conditions for understanding contemporary health equalities, inequality uh, is uh, to remind us uh, genocide of Indigenous peoples and enslavement of Africans, the legalization and enforcement of slavery, the forcible removal of Indigenous peoples from their lands, the Jim Crow laws, the war on drugs, mass incarceration of black people, discrimination in the rental and housing markets, economically segregated neighborhoods, economic injustice and uh, social deprivation, inadequate health care, environmental and occupational health uh, inequities, political exclusion and suppression. So basically, uh, as I said, uh, these are the, the events for the last 400 years, right? And uh, they, I see them all as instances that play into structural racism that maintains ongoing health disparities in the 21st century. Uh, and in this section, I go back, right, uh, in the 20th century, uh, and I think about uh, the work of Black churches, uh, women's organizations, civil rights, and, uh, and radical political groups, uh, for which health became central to the continued struggle for equity. So to this end, uh, section two invites us to reconsider some uh, influential uh, moments and organizations in the 20th century, including the civil rights movement of the 60s and the Black Panther Party. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a piece of uh, archival uh, ephemera. That's a fact sheet of uh, the Black Panther Party compiled by the New Haven uh, Panther Defense Committee from 1969. 
which is basically a document of actually right what the party uh, uh, was about, the timeline, goals, events, activities, police brutality, and common misconceptions uh, and conspiracy theories. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, the party has been remembered as a political organization that underwent violent confrontation with the state. But for this context, I really want to uh, uh, put forward the fact that uh, the party uh, was uh, serving people, right? Uh, and what I mean by that, the party offered new forms of community care. Uh, it was oriented towards improving health conditions from 1969 onwards. A variety of community social program programs uh, were part of this core uh, activity, right? Such as the free breakfast for children program and free community uh, health clinics, right? Um, in addition, the section stresses uh, how white supremacy and police brutality uh, has been suppressing Black prosperity and thus well being and health, especially if we think about how. Uh, Political aspect and uh, uh, yeah, political aspect corresponds with well-being and health, right? Um, so, next slide, please. For example, we can go back to 96, uh, 1963 Birmingham, Alabama protest that was surprised by police, right? So we have Bruce Davidson uh, photograph. Uh, Davidson, an American phot photographer, worked as a freelance photographer for Life magazine, and he pursued uh, civil rights work. Uh, for five years, he would do uh, photographs of many protests and also a photograph of poverty uh, in the South. Um, and here we have uh, arrest of a demonstrator here in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and uh, in 1963, a peaceful civil rights uh, demonstrate, uh, demonstrations were faced with police, dogs, and fire hoses. Uh, the Birmingham campaign was a model for a nonviolent direct action protest and directly paved uh, the way to um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, right, which, was, which prohibited racial discrimination in hiring practices and public services throughout the USA. Uh, next slide. Uh, then we have something similar, similar event, and this is a, a acrylic and silk screen painting by Andy Warco, right, who turned uh, this uh, uh, moment uh, in 1964 into a pop art spectacle uh, titled uh, the piece Birmingham Race Riot, which in itself is kind of problematic title. Uh, and this print is uh, uh, a photograph taken by Charles Moore, published in Life magazine, right? That was an editorial that was supposed to, you know, shock the American public what's happening in Alabama, right? Uh, and uh, Warhol was sued because he didn't have the rights. Uh, uh, it's interesting though, in 2014, uh, at Christie's in New York, uh, the work was sold for almost $63 million, right? So that kind of begs a question for me, right? Uh, both in terms of Davidson and Warhol, right? Uh, uh, right, we could raise a question of the white male ethnographic gaze and the function of depicting police brutality, right? So one scholar, uh, some scholars uh, find that this reproduction is an example of what uh, scholar uh, Horton Spiller called porn trapping. Uh, it could also be thought of as scopophilia, right? Which is kind of taking pleasure in gazing black life being violated and killed. And other scholars uh, think that this kind of documentary images are tools to educate the public and uh, thereby contribute towards social change. Right, so this is also something we could maybe discuss later if there's time. Um, so, um, and again, this second section, right, is all about kind of how uh, history and present uh, interact, right? So, uh, and how systemic inequalities from histories are carried into the present. Next slide, please. Uh, to think about that, uh, uh, the exhibition uh, installed uh, conceptual artist Glenn Ligon's pieces. Uh, who kind of um, points out how racism persists today, right, in his series Runaways, which is a set of 10 uh, lithographs. Uh, Ligon asked friends to write, uh, uh, to write descriptions uh, of him as if they were reporting a missing person to the police. Uh, then he included 10 different uh, de uh, descriptions of himself. Uh, as text in a series of posters depicting himself as a runaway slave in the style of 19th century 
broadsheets that were circulated by slave owners to locate runaway, runaway slaves. By submitting the description of his own body to the text uh, about uh, the runaway, uh, Ligon points how the history of slavery still exists in the United States today, um, present throughout the legal, social, and political structures that condition contemporary Black well being, mobility, and freedom. And we've been all witnessing how that has been going uh, on for the last uh, couple of years, but in, in actuality, for the last 400 years. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I'm just going to have a sip of water. Um, I'm going to come back to Ligon because Ligon is important for some of the works in Section 3. Overall, a reference to civil rights movement uh, in the contemporary social movement brings us to section that uh, uh, explores the role of public art during the three contemporary health crises that we are witnessing, right? Uh, it demonstrates how the AIDS movement, the movement for Black lives, and COVID-related activism have been educating the masses and resisting systemic violence. Uh, these movements use effective advertising, including posters, brochures, pamphlets, uh, pins, signs, LED screens, and billboards. Um, this section uh, is envisioned as a poster wall, uh, and it kind of uh, uh, it overlaps those three crises through uh, visual language, right? The crisis uh, of uh, anti-black racism, COVID, and HIV and AIDS. Uh, and it also kind of shows us, right, how history and present coexist. Um, a little bit about the posters. The posters had a crucial role in the history of activism in the late 20th century. Uh, this was especially, this was especially uh, uh, the case during the early AIDS movement in the 80s, uh, at the time propaganda and advertising have had major influences on constructing the meaning of uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, and those constructions were usually uh, racist and uh, homophobic misconceptions, right? Uh, we can think about uh, early uh, nomenclature for uh, HIV that was a GRED, GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, uh, or also known as gay plague, or you know, thinking about the fact that uh, uh, in the USA, um, a disease always comes from somewhere else. Uh, in the case of uh, HIV AIDS, that was Africa. In the case of uh, COVID-19, uh, that is uh, uh, a body of Asian descent. I'm going to come to that in a little bit. Uh, so to counter uh, harmful discourses and resist misconceptions created by those homophobic and ra uh, racist state institutions, activists and artists draw on cultures of earlier genres, right, including pop art, minimalism, feminist art, uh, as well as anti-war propaganda uh, and the street posters developed during the protests for civil rights, uh, women's rights, and gay rights during the late 1960s. There's another correlation uh, to the uh, earlier decades. Uh, the use of familiar images from pop culture was important and a strategic way kind of to educate the masses, to get people attention, right, to let them know what's happening and then when getting their attention kind of to, you know, let them know how they can engage. Uh, and this is something, right, uh, that's uh, how I would like to use this gallery for my students, right, uh, next week when we go to the gallery, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, engage them. Uh, through visual language uh, and landscapes, and then kind of, you know, uh, enact uh, action on a micro level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this section also uh, includes local centralist activism, uh, very rich. Uh, we have ephemera from uh, the Laura and Moore collection from the Washington University Archives. Uh, Moore was a St. Louis civil uh, rights leader and community activist also co-founder of the Lesbian Alliance in the late 1960s. With others, Moore helped found uh, a rape crisis center and the St. Louis um, Abused Women's uh, Support Project. On the right side, we have uh, Bob uh, Hansman, who I hope is uh, here with us tonight. Uh, this is uh, his advertisement uh, uh, composed for the 1986 uh, Pride uh, Guide. Uh, Hansman, uh, uh, he's associate professor in the Washington University School of Architecture. And uh, the, the advertisement was uh, designed for St. Louis Effort for AIDS, organization founded in 1985 
uh, it was uh, in early years, it was uh, driven by volunteers and donations. Early programs included an inf uh, information, uh, information hotline, patient advocacy, uh, home health care, and um, counseling services. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we have, uh, uh, right. so AIDS has been thought as a manageable, uh, HIV AIDS has been treated as a manageable chronic uh, disease, right? Uh, and that might suggest that it's not a problem anymore. But now here we have uh, a poster by Charles Ryan Long and Christopher uh, Paul Jordan, right? Who uh, kind of warn us that the crisis persists uh, and that's very uh, uh, present and noted in legislations that criminalize HIV through non-disclosure laws. Uh, and uh, very briefly, these laws put a person living with HIV at risk, excuse me, at risk of persecution and incarceration for consensual sexual activity if they don't notify uh, their partner of their status, regardless of condom use, viral load, or actual risk. And uh, this legislation uh, influenced people who are already stigmatized, right? So, and uh, those a group of people include sex workers, trans and queer people of color, and uh, they demonstrate how the public health and the law work in tandem to criminalize the most vulnerable among us, right? So there was a case in 2013, Michael Johnson, who was at the time 23 year old teenager, uh, and I'm not going to go into details, we don't have time, uh, but uh, he was uh, sentenced to uh, 30 years of prison. Uh, he is a black teenager, uh, but then uh, because of the pressures of the public and activist engagement, he was released in 2019. Um, I skipped many details. I'm sure that in the audience, uh, there are uh, people uh, who have more knowledge about this uh, and that was outside of uh, St. Louis in Missouri. Um, Right, so HR criminalization disclosure laws. Uh, so the poster was initially commissioned for the ex uh, exhibition Cell Count, curated by Kyle Croft and uh, Asher uh, Moniz for Visual Aids. Uh, it's, uh, it was reproduced uh, for uh, our exhibition and it's free for the lab grabs. So if you are uh, uh, fast and lucky, you can have a very beautiful uh, two sided letter press that's probably gonna be worth a lot of money as most as happens with those posters. Uh, I know that uh, a poster by our organization Red Hot uh, in New York uh, can be bought for $5,000 on eBay. Um, and, you know, uh, for, it's for the grab so we can think about how this, you know, works uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of combining uh, uh, pop culture and high art, but also, you know, higher being accessible to people. Uh, it's very important also for this context. So as I said, it's a two-sided letter press calls uh, on the communities most likely to be subjected to unjust uh, HIV disclosure laws to resist uh, racist, sexist, transphobic, xenophobic, sex negative and classist systems and governments. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So speaking of uh, intergenerational conundrums, uh, this letter press was inspired by an 1851 poster made uh, in Boston by abolitionist Theodore Parker as a reaction to the Fugitive Slave Law, a bill that required law enforcement in states free of slavery to support the capturing and returning uh, of fugitive slaves to states where slavery was still legal. So here we can kind of see the connection to Ligon, right? Uh, uh, similar to Ligon, Long and Johnson investigate the past to enact a deep critique of the American society of the present. Uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, tonight I would like to finish with this uh, beautiful and very important sign, uh, digital sign made by uh, Asian American Feminist Collective, a grassroots uh, racial and gender justice group based in uh, New York City. Uh, so this is a digital sign. Uh, it's available on, it's on display uh, on an on a, uh, iPad, uh, but also um, I have a PDF. It's available online, but I can also forward you the PDF if you'd like to uh, have it for your own um, archive. Uh, this was made in collaboration with uh, Blue Stockings in New York, uh, and the design reacts to racist and xenophobic discourses that equate a body of Asian descent with COVID. Uh, this equation is a result of um, uh, 
a historical pattern where uh, exclusion or restriction of Asian immigrations and racist scapegoating of uh, Asian Americans converge during period of public health crisis, right? So what's happening now and what has been happening for the last couple of years, it's not new. It's kind of, you know, history repeats itself. So for example, uh, the same occurred with the Chinese Exclusion Act of uh, 1882 which banned the entry of Chinese immigrant labor into uh, the United States. The uh, Zion also kind of goes through that uh, exclusionary and racist uh, history. Uh, but at the same time, the Zion offers hope, right? So uh, it explores COVID-19 crisis through longstanding practices of care that come out of uh, Asian American histories and policies and provides tools for self-care and a sense of belonging uh, to a community. Uh, I'm going to stop there and uh, I'm going to take a sip of water and uh, I'm going to, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Yvonne, for that overview of your great, um, terrific installation. Um, we have time for some questions from the audience. If anybody has some questions for Yvonne, you can go ahead and put them. Oops, sorry, I'm in the chat. I'm oh, sorry. I'm having some trouble seeing the chat myself. Yvonne, can you see it? But I wonder if uh, while people are thinking their questions, Yvonne, could you just explain one bit when you were talking about the letterpress? Can we go back to that one? Maybe I'll go back to the that slide. So was the work the work was made in 2019? And was it, it was originally made to be like a takeaway? Is that correct? That's part, that's fundamental to the work itself. It's not a curatorial decision on your part to make it something that is given uh, no, to the that, visitor? No, that, that was original. That was original. Mm -hmm. So it was originally uh, intended uh, to be taken. Uh, and that kind of, uh, I mean, if if we kind of put that in the context of uh, uh, age-related Aryan activism, uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, uh, he was doing something similar with his work, kind of he was envisioning right, uh, techniques of redistributive sharing, right? So this is kind of, I mean, I see it as, a, you know, in this context, but uh, um, I mean, the, one of the artists is here, so we can ask him directly. But yes, uh, it was uh, intended for the grabs uh, in 2018 too. And that exhibition, um, Cell Count, uh, it's an amazing exhibition uh was kind of thematizing HIV criminalization in kind of a larger context of uh uh systemic violence and uh, surveillance right uh so this poster kind of also speaks to that mm -hmm. i think charles uh ryan long wrote in the chat the democratic multiple yes <laughs> correct uh you know we do have a, a question uh in the chat also which you kind of touched on some of the problematic definitions of health, but this one says, I would love to hear your recommendation for a definition of health. That's an excellent question. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't have it, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, so we, we were covering that topic in my class, the first couple of um, uh, sessions, right? And we are engaging uh, a lens of social constructivism. So instead of kind of offering, you know, positivist uh, definitions uh, or definitions that are then being used in a positive kind of way, uh, for me it's more, you know, crucial to, you know, uh, unpack a definition, right? To what I did at the beginning of this uh, presentation, right? To see what the, uh, the definition is, how is it mobilized? Uh, who benefits from it, who doesn't, uh, and then, you know, uh, move from there. But I usually don't like definitions. Um, uh, I think Deborah Lupton, uh, um, a scholar in uh, medical humanities, uh, kind of talks about health, also kind of deconstructs it and talks about uh, that health is a relation between bodies, between bodies and institutions. So whatever you know that entails, because health nowadays can mean many things, uh, but not in concrete, basically, right? Great. Uh, so we have another question it says, amazing work. This is such a wonderful layered exhibition. What was one of the first pieces that you knew you wanted to include in the exhibit and why? Oh, Vida, thank you for that question. Uh, so, um, 
I <laughs> and Meredith uh, Malone knows that. So uh, when we had a first meeting, uh, I came because the idea was kind of, you know, to select what I would like to see there. And I came in like at least 20 to 30 pieces. And Meredith was like, no, no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was very excited to uh, see uh, pieces. Uh, let me look at the setting uh, to see new pieces, right? Uh, that was kind of, that were kind of like inspiring and I didn't know nothing about. And then I had uh, an opportunity to uh, learn more about them, both through uh, merited guidance, but also just making my um, uh, research. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it was great to see some works that I. Uh, in person that before I only saw online, right? So for example, Kissing Doesn't Kill by Grand Fury. Uh, Meredith, if you could go, um, that's one of the first slides. Uh, it's, we have three pictures of the setup. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's very kind of known uh, uh, activist work in the history of uh, uh, the AIDS movement. Uh, but I never had, you know, uh, an idea that it's this big, right? Or also a Glenn uh, Ligon's, um, uh, work uh, I never saw in person, so it's very it, it's different, right? And this is why, for example, I didn't uh, uh, I didn't bring my students to the uh, we're going to the gallery next week, and uh, you know I want them to experience uh, the works in person for the first time. I did kind of like give them a taste today a little bit through a presentation, but it's kind of different to engage with the work in person and seeing it on the screen, right? Uh, so yeah. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, I was excited about uh, most of the works. I was also excited about the works that, uh, well, actually, I'm not going to put it right now. Um, yeah, never mind. Okay. Um, we have uh, another great question say, the saying, again, thank you for your illuminating and visually provocative presentation. I'm wondering if this exhibit is related to your larger book project and how, or where we might be willing we might be able to find your thinking and writing about these artworks and assemblages. Oh, thanks for this question. That's a nice question. So uh, yes, this, uh, this exhibition is related uh, to my larger uh, body of work. Um, so uh, I'm kind of curious about, uh, in my larger work, about uh, intergenerational exchanges, right? How histories, uh, how past and present interact, right? Especially in light of uh, HIV uh, AIDS crisis. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, there's gonna be a colloquium uh, of my work uh, on 21st of February. I'm gonna be talking about two artists and prevention workers. One is Apollo Gomez, the other one is uh, Sheldon Raymour, uh, who are kind of, uh, <clears throat> they're uh, contemporary artists. Uh, their, their work is very young, uh, but, um, uh, in attempt to kind of educate the public about uh, high rates of the virus in Latinx and indigenous communities, they are going into the past, right? They're going into the uh, first wave of the AIDS crisis and images uh, pertinent to that decade, uh, but they're going even further, kind of uh, engage with uh, uh, their ancestors. So I'm kind of like curious, you know, what does what do this um, what do these uh, uh, dialogues, I call them uh, intergenerational dialogues, do for us in this present moment when we think about uh, HIV and AIDS uh, in this context? Um, yeah, and also uh, I think uh, I think this this exhibition has been super inspiring. So I think in one of my chapters I'm gonna include uh, the uh, exhibition as well. Uh, and yeah, so just one other thing. Um, I mean, uh, I look at uh, diverse, I mean, different types of work, right? But I'm uh, uh, mostly focused on, uh, as you uh, read in the bio, uh, works that take uh, anti-HIV medication and prevention method as a key visual uh, strategy, right? So to kind of like critique problematic pharmaceutical companies of uh, politics uh, of the AZT era, uh, art era and prep era. Great. We have a, several more questions uh, in the chat. So one uh, participant is saying, I really like your framing of the Black Panther Party as attuned to community care. Could you say more about how we can think about political and our artistic movements as both community care and communities that care? Could you please repeat the question? I wasn't paying attention, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> uh, it's a, a related to the Black Panther Party as you talked about it as attuned to community care. Can you say more about how we can think about political and or artistic movements 
as both community care and communities that care? Well, that's a very uh, layered question. Uh, I mean, I feel that, uh, you know, uh, all movements uh, or uh, artworks that represent specific movements are uh, kind of uh, made uh, because, you know, one has care for community, right? So the the, the AIDS movement, for example, I mean, Grand Fury uh, uh, and even, you know, Bob Hansman's work or uh, Laura Moore, right? I mean, all of those work were driven by care for community, right? Uh, and they were, I mean, very much politicized, right? Because uh, uh, HIV AIDS, uh, I mean, uh, it's a discourse, right? It's a political discourse that's being mobilized against people, that's being mobilized against the weakest among us, right? So. Uh, all activists work, right? And uh, I mean, we ha have uh, Ted, uh, Ted Kerr here in the audience, right? Who knows a lot about care and how uh, uh, activist communities uh, with that effect, right? Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that kind of answers the question, but again, I mean, we have, you know, uh, uh, works from the AIDS movement, from uh, the civil rights movement, from, uh, uh, the COVID, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a movement, but COVID uh, communal activism, right? Uh, so yeah. Ivan, there's another question that's asking sort of about that, that mix of materials in the exhibition too. That's a mix of sort of, they're saying inside materials from inside the museum and outside the museum. If you wanted to share a little bit about your thoughts about bringing together some of you know, the works from the Kemper's collection, but also from the um, uh, university libraries. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I mean, I think it's always uh, interesting kind of like to mix, uh, you know, high art with low art or, you know, pop culture and see what the, what, what can we learn from the mix, right? Uh, I mean, um, there is so much, uh, you know, uh, in the archives, there is so much uh, knowledge that's just sitting there, right? And it can teach us so much, right? Not only about, uh, you know, how activism was uh, or is uh, mobilized, but also, you know, uh, you know, uh, some works that never see the light of the day, right? So uh, I was kind of driven by that idea, right? But also, you know, I mean, um, I was also driven by, you know, uh, pop art politics, let's say, that uh, kind of also uh, uh, mixes the two, right? To mobilize the masses. So my idea here is also kind of to mobilize the masses by providing uh, materials that are high art, but also materials that are, you know, from the outside, uh, materials that are posters, materials that are posters for, uh, uh, you know, that people can take away uh, and just kind of, you know, to uh, make them think, uh, make us all think, right? Um, how does this concern us or not? Uh, and if not, uh, what, uh, can we do for our communities, whoever those communities are? And uh, yeah, that's kind of the premise of my class, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have another question that's kind of along the same, similar lines, coming back to the notion of the democratic multiple. Um, they were saying they're curious if you could share some more information about the SMS um, portfolio and how it worked. If you see the medium of mail art uh, in dialogue with the posters and this notion of the democratic multiple. Wow. Okay. So uh, I can help you out a little bit. That. Yeah, I, 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 I was just gonna. SMS. <laughs> no, I was gonna say I was gonna ask so maybe, for assistance, but I so I, so I did do some research and I know that uh, it 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 was uh, it was alive for only one year in 1968. I forgot the uh, uh, the. Uh, person's name, but uh, it was also actually idea, right? So basically it was a subscription, right? And uh, there was like five or six, uh, five or six volumes throughout the year. And the idea was kind of uh, basically similar to my idea here, kind of to mix uh, high art uh, with uh, uh, pop culture and make high art uh, uh, available, available for everybody, right? Uh, and then Meredith, please. Yeah, and that's where the shit must stop comes from. It's about like, you know, the the market, the art market, really. It's sort of a movement towards, yeah, kind of the, this sort of more democratic, more like financially feasible uh, distribution of art. And each one of these boxes had several different kinds of work. It was just work related to pop art, work related to fluxes, work with conceptual art, all like, and everyone was kind of a, a crazy mix. You can see some of the examples that you just pulled out of. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Meredith. And then as for the uh, democratic multiple, I mean, if we think about the idea here being, you know, are being accessible 
to everybody, right? Uh, then yes, then I would say this is you know fits into uh, this consideration. But then you know, I mean, we could, we also have to take into consideration. Okay, I mean, this was 1968, right? So the fact that you know we have this piece with uh, uh, titled Candy and piece titled Hot and Tot Apron, right? That's you know then for discussion like what uh, artwork was there, right? And then you know my question or open thought: How do we treat that artwork today? Right, uh, mm -hmm. but that's maybe a conversation for another time. Uh, I think we, we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, we, this one comes from, I believe, one of your students uh, uh, who says that they were wondering how you started researching this topic and what inspired you to look into the social construction of health. Ooh, uh, so that's a good question. Uh, so uh, what made me, could you repeat please? what what uh where did you how did you start researching this topic and what inspired you to look into the social construction of health right uh so uh, i mean my work uh for the last uh seven or eight years more or less has been pertinent to uh uh hiv aids art and activism it started with researching uh prep culture PrEP being uh, short for pre exploratory prophylaxis, which is uh, a newer drug that works as a condom, right? A person takes it uh, uh, every day, and then if taken as prescribed, it um, uh, prevents contraction of HIV uh, over 90%, right? So and that kind of led me into thinking about, uh, you know, uh, AIDS and uh, AIDS-related art and activism and how PrEP uh, fits into that, uh, those narratives. Uh, and I'm a, a, a queer study scholar, right? So basically when we talk about um, social construction of health, we are talking about queering of health, right? So because that's what queer theory does, right? It undoes uh, notions that we take for granted that are naturalized, right? Such, such as sexuality, gender, race. And then I uh, also uh, consider health as being one of those, um, being one of those uh, categories. Uh, so yeah, I'm just kind of, you know, uh, expanding, right? Uh, thinking about, uh, uh, I started, let's say with PrEP, then I went into the HIV, H-related art and activism, and now I'm kind of trying to frame those narratives in a larger umbrella of health, right? And what can uh, social constructivism or queerness, queering can, uh, uh, you know, how can uh, those instances make us rethink what a better definition for health would be? So I think there was, um, I think we do need to wrap up, but I wanted to say to the, in case anybody's not looking at the chat, there was another question about how to come and see the show. Um, yeah, though I want to say again that it's on view until through May 2nd. And if anybody is interested in a tour, um, our head of education, Meredith Lehman, has uh, put her email in the chat as well. So you can contact her directly if you're interested. Yeah, Yvonne. And I was just gonna say, uh, so uh, this show is not only for my students. Uh, I'm also gonna do tours uh, for some of my colleagues. I, in March, I'm gonna uh, do a private tour for uh, Professor Barbara uh, Baugander's class. So in case there are people who would like to, you know, a private tour or would like to, you know, uh, me to talk with uh, their students about similar topics in the gallery. Uh, I'm not sure there's how, how does that happen? Do they reach out directly to you or to me or both or? Uh, to Meredith, Meredith Lehman, again, you can reach out to the education department directly. And there was another question about where this, this we have recorded this wonderful uh, tour tonight, and it will be posted within another week on the um, museum's uh, YouTube page. Well, Ivan, really, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to hear uh, more about, you know, the inter thoughts behind this exhibition, and I am so pleased to have you as a colleague here at WashU, and uh, thank you so much. Likewise, thank you very much. And thanks everybody for joining us tonight.